Hey everyone, welcome to the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's June breakfast lecture. If you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself uh, in the chat, let us know who you are, where you're zooming in from, make sure that it's uh, selected to panelists and attendees so everyone can see who's in our Zoom room this morning. Uh, thanks, Bill, for kicking us off with that. Nice, nice to see you here this morning. I don't know about you guys, but um, here in Hyde Park, New York, we're waking up to the one of the nicest mornings we've had in about a week. Um, finally, really happy to have the windows open and the fresh air blowing through and uh, good to go out and do the chicken chores and just feel like it was a beautiful morning in the Northeast. So uh, it's been uh, it's been hot. But as a hydrogeologist, for those of you who had the big waterfront, big rain front come through, I think, a weekend ago, about 10 days ago now. At least here, we got about three inches of rain over almost uh, two days or so. Uh, that was fantastic. We've had a dry spring um, and that rain came in a long, slow manner, uh, which in fact meant that we didn't have a lot of flooding and instead what we had was a lot of terrific aquifer recharge. So that was that was an amazing couple days to uh, kind of put everything back in tip top condition as we head into the summer. Otherwise, this time of year is when natural recession is exactly what you'd be expecting to see in all the, or, uh, the aquifers. The, the winter recharge season has kind of slowed down, um, mostly because of apotranspiration has picked up. You know, vegetation is a, is a, is a wonderful thing, but it's an extra, extravagant user of water. Um, and so from this time through to uh, maybe October or November, we really see, expect to see the majority of rainfall uh, supporting vegetation and only extraordinary events really meaningfully contribute to aquifer recharge. So um, uh, it was great to have those three inches to put a lot back into the ground as we go forward now into the summer. Waiting for a few more people to sign in. And then uh, Emily, you've had an announcement, I think. Yeah, so um, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's annual awards benefit is coming up. That's the Toast to the Tribs. That will be on Tuesday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. We're doing a live stream. Uh, virtual fundraiser which is open for anyone to view but of course we encourage your generous donations if you're able to give um one we're going to be recognizing our watershed wave maker awardees elena onion the bronx river alliance outdoor promise and the stormwater coalition of albany county so i'm going to drop a link to the in into the chat for more information on that program and and we hope to see you there So for those of you who are familiar with uh, our traditional format meeting at a diner in New Paltz, um, this has been uh, another annual cycle, uh, September to June, where we, um, we're not able to do that. And um, I think we're hoping that uh, when we reopen uh, this coming fall, we may be able to, that would be wonderful. For those of you who have uh, gotten into the habit of coming by Zoom or who are really much further from Central Hudson Valley, uh, that might be a difficulty and I, I apologize. Um, but one of the missions of the Watershed Alliance is uh, networking and collaboration and friendships, uh, as well as these continuing education opportunities to enrich our understanding of, of watersheds and tributaries and issues related to water. So um, I'm guessing we may be back in the fall. We'll see how that goes. Um, we have a very uh, interesting and exciting speaker this morning. Um, you know that uh, these watershed breakfasts, sometimes it's economics, sometimes it's biology, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's, it's plants. Um, and so um, any, anything that has the nexus of water uh, because uh, we're a tributary organization. Um, and so um, Emily and Aaron made contact and I'm delighted to have Aaron Rice here today, um, beaming in from Ithaca. Um, and um, uh, I think it almost makes most sense, Aaron, for you to introduce yourself, um, but, uh, 
but the things that I've been hearing about the acoustic work you're doing, um, we've all heard about Songs of the Whales and uh, some, some know about sturgeon sounds, but uh, there's, a, there's a fine mesh here that you've, you've studied here that is just fascinating based on what, I'm, what the, the clues you've given me. Um, Emily, did you wanna talk about format here? Um, questions and answers and that kind of thing? Sure, so um, we have this set up as a Zoom webinar. So if you have questions for Aaron during the talk, please use the Q&A uh, box at the bottom. Uh, he's offered, if you have any questions to clarify certain things, um, please feel free to put those and he'll answer them in real time. But otherwise, we'll wait until the end of the session and have a longer Q&A period after his talk. Yeah, so, so um, Aaron's joining us here today. We will close at uh, 9.30 as our customary time. Um, Aaron, Aaron works with the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which has a, a group that goes far beyond birds, as we will hear. Um, a research scientist, um, a lot of work in um, marine settings, um, but an increasing uh, concentration of work also in freshwater settings. And um, I think maybe I should stop right there, Aaron, and turn this over to you. And thanks very much. The time is yours until 9.30. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm really excited to uh, present some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so I'm a marine and aquatic biologist by, by training and inclination. Um, and one of the things that sort of defines my research program is trying to study animal behavior and animal ecology th uh, through the sounds that these critters produce. And one of the things that's been exciting, particularly at a place like the Lab of Ornithology, where <clears throat> the, you know, the first sounds in nature were recordings done in Ithaca in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and so Ithaca has always been this sort of nexus of this uh, quirky little field that we uh, hear about called bioacoustics. And as always, uh, in a place like Ithaca, we've got, you know, we have workshops, we have students, we have uh, visiting uh, collaborators that are coming through. And through the happenstance of science, one afternoon, I happened to be uh, in my office uh, and one of the, the folks in my group said, hey, Aaron, I want to introduce you to Maya Nemisto, who works for DEC. She's really kind of interested in, in cultivating uh, acoustics um, in the Hudson, you know, thought you might be interested in chatting with her. And that was about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, and that was sort of like this initial uh, interaction that has really uh, given rise to this really exciting project. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we've been doing uh, in the Hudson over the past couple of years. Uh, a lot of it's sort of a high level overview, sort of setting the stage for where we're going. And then, you know, some, some initial results. Uh, but you can start to see, hopefully at the end of this, how the idea of studying a river through the sounds of its constituents or the sounds of its inhabitants is actually a fairly intuitive approach. Uh, and before I get too far into it, I definitely want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, Patrick Baker at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, Alex Flecker, a professor uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell, and, and of course, Maya at DEC. Uh, without this team, I mean, this is one of the great things about science, where it's this really collaborative, interactive, team-based effort, um, where all of us are sort of bringing different components to this project, uh, making it sort of this really, really uh, uh, special endeavor. So with that, what I will do is I will share my screen. Um, and make sure that you all can see it. Um, that look okay? Great. Um, so the, there's a lot of different aspects of, of bioacoustics um, that we'll sort of go over. But I think, you know, when, when people hear this word, it's intuitive for some, uh, not for others. But I, I would uh, surmise that you are more familiar with acoustics uh, as, as a discipline uh, than you may realize. That so sound uh, in the environment is one of these sort of cues that we use as humans over evolutionary history to really uh, sort of sense and perceive the world around us. And so these could be from environmental cues or people talking or uh, sort of other components. Um, and this same pattern holds true uh, across the animal kingdom. So uh, I happened to be out last night as one does as a naturalist uh, in Ithaca, New York uh, and recorded some frogs um, in my neighborhood, this is what it would sound like. And there's a couple really exciting things that start to emerge with this, what we describe as an acoustic scene. So what you see in front of you is the visual de depiction of the soundscape. We refer to this as a spectrogram, where it's a visualization of sound as a function of frequency on the y-axis 
uh, versus time on the x-axis. You read it from left to right, and sort of at the bottom is sort of a lower pitch, uh, and on the top of the graph is the higher pitch. You read it basically the same way you would read uh, sheet music uh, for those musicians in the audience. Um, and there's a couple of different things uh, that emerge from this. So this is about a minute of sound, um, and even just looking at the image, there's a number of things that, that jump out. So you can see that we've got a few different species of frogs that are uh, immediately apparent, um, bullfrogs and green frogs in this sort of low frequency register, sort of calling intermittently. We've got a whole bunch of gray tree frogs calling on and off with a couple elements of their uh, harmonics that are showing up. Uh, passing car, so the sounds of human are occurring um, and detectable. These sort of broadband sounds happen to be residual uh, precipitation dropping off the leaves that you're hearing. And then in the background, you'll, you may not hear it, but you can certainly see it. Other um, more quieter uh, denizens of the, uh, of the uh, night soundscape where you, know, you can hear birds um, and other uh, things happening. The other thing, so in addition to species occurrence or the, the, you know, the different aspects of the community assembly, there's a couple other th pieces of information that you can take away from a representation like this. So uh, if I draw you to your eyes to about 43 seconds on the spectrogram, here's two different examples. Uh, we've got a bullfrog that's pretty close to where I'm recording and then other bullfrogs that are more distant. So not only can we get species composition from these kinds of sound recordings. We can get information on relative distance to the microphone. We can get an idea of the abundance of calling individuals. We know that for these frogs, these are uh, mating displays where males are advertising for females so we can get behavioral context. And so even with what starts out, there's a relatively simple 60 second snapshot of sound there's quite a bit of information that you can glean from it. And even by looking at it visually, you can get even more information and do so readily rapidly. So this field of bioacoustics fundamentally is the study of animal acoustic communication. So we know that across the animal kingdom, sound uh, is regularly used as, uh, in the context of intra and interspecific uh, communication. And certainly for those of you that are birders, um, the idea of birdsong is a really obvious uh, component of bioacoustics and has been uh, the foundation of the field. Um, particularly at this time of the year, I'm sure that you all have been hearing about the emergence of cicada brood 10 uh, and the obnoxious sounds that they may be producing. Obnoxious is subjective. Um, I think it's great. But, you know, so you got birds, you've got insects making sounds uh, above water and then below water, certainly the sounds of humpback whales that started to be described in the 1970s um, are one of the sort of common uh, components or, or you know, well, under, well appreciated components of the underwater soundscape. But then what I'm going to try to convince you of over the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so is that equally interesting and exciting are the sounds produced by fishes. So, you know, here you have uh, three or four toadfish uh, down at the uh, south end of the Hudson River. Um, and I think these guys are a very much underappreciated but really fascinating component of, uh, of underwater soundscapes. And so not in addition to studying uh, animal sounds and what they're doing and when they're active, we can also start to study sort of the overall sort of uh, more complete record of sound um, that include not only environmental components like rain and wind and things like that, um, but also uh, the human footprint on ecosystems. So if I could just sort of take you through a, a thought experiment, it's not too difficult to surmise that if you were uh, in this open field um, and you were to listen, you would hear running water of this stream, you might hear birds flying overhead, uh, you might hear the wind rustling through the grass. So you'd be able to understand the, the weather, the, you know, sort of the dynamics of the ecosystem. Um, you know, it's gonna come across as a relatively uh, sort of pristine habitat um, that we can think of sort of the soundscape um, that would match uh, this particular environment. And it's not too difficult then to contrast something like this more pristine uh, mountain setting uh, with something like this, where it, you're not going to hear the sounds of running water or, you know, frogs calling or, or readily uh, hear birds. Uh, you're going to hear traffic. You're going to hear people. You're going to hear lots of noise. And so this is a nice contrast between what we think of a, uh, you know, relatively pristine and um, sort of natural soundscape and something that has a high degree of human impact or in a more urbanized setting. And we can draw these contrasts not only above, uh, above water in terrestrial settings, but we can also do the same thing in aquatic settings. So it's not too difficult uh, to envision how this 
uh, lovely sandy beach in the tropics is going to sound something very different than a highly urbanized uh, commercial shipping port with with ships going uh, in it, in and out. One of the differences, though, is that between in the lower panel on the left and the right, you still may have the same types of uh, uh, critters calling. You know, even in urbanized uh, seaports. You know, we're regularly seeing humpback whales uh, coming in and out of the lower harbor estuary. There's lots of lots of fish. And so one of the challenges that human footprints on different ecosystems creates is it very much constrains uh, sort of the acoustic ability for these animals uh, to communicate. And in fact, what we will see is that animals across all uh, taxonomic groups and all ecosystems really use sound uh, as a fundamental component of their life history. So we've talked about a couple of different things. We've talked about the communication. We've talked about soundscapes. And a lot of this is sort of coalescing into this emergent, uh, relatively recently described field of acoustic ecology, taking different components of the production and perception of sound, how the, those uh, aspects of sound may influence behavior, what are the consequences of human-generated noise on ecosystem function, um, is there injury, is there stress, um, and how can animals sort of use these different pieces of information to understand the environment in which they live. And, you know, sort of as this depiction um, in this figure shows is that all of these components are inherently related. So um, with sound, it's the same system that's picking it up. Um, it's a, sort of this broadly apl applicable framework to think about how we understand sound in the natural environment. So in my group um, at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics, uh, I'm really fortunate to be part of a really big and diverse team where this is an example of all of the projects around the world that we currently have going on. So all of the, uh, the little yellow pointers are our marine and freshwater projects um, around the world. Uh, and then all of our orange uh, pointers are different terrestrial projects. So we work on everything from uh, gibbons and orangutans in Southeast Asia. I have a project on lyrebirds in South Australia. We do work on crickets and katydids in uh, Central America. And then of course we do work on whales, dolphins, fish, frogs, uh, pretty much everything that you can think about. And so one of the things that emerges from this is this really collaborative uh, lab group um, with expertise in different taxonomic systems that we can use to help improve our study of our own uh, species or ecosystem that we're particularly interested in. And so uh, what emerged from this was that, you know, like I mentioned with the, the collaboration with Maya, you know, we had this presence um, our group was working in New York Bight doing a uh, long-term uh, passive acoustic survey for whales uh, in New York Bight, uh, funded by New York DEC. And it was, you know, a pretty exciting opportunity when uh, Maya suggested that, hey, what about extending your sensor network up into the Hudson and not only getting things in, of, uh, of listening for, for whales and such, but also some of the fish and the other different aspects of the Hudson. And that's given rise to this really uh, exciting dynamic process. The course um, of the presentation is just kind of go over this high level uh, project that we've been doing of what can broadly be described as uh, understanding the, the different soundscapes of the Hudson River uh, as it extends basically uh, from Albany uh, down to uh, Manhattan. There's a couple of different aspects of this project. You know, broadly, what is the acoustic diversity uh, and ecology of the Hudson River? Um, which species of fish are making sounds? We know that there's lots of different fish uh, in the Hudson. Um, what is the influence of humans uh, on this, on these different ecosystems within the Hudson and its tributaries? Um, you know, including things like uh, dams and their removal, uh, the footprint of different transportation systems going uh, north and south uh, along the river. And then finally, being able to understand how do environmental changes along the Hudson modify both uh, the soundscape as well as overall aquatic biodiversity. So we're not the first to try to record uh, in the Hudson. Um, there was a, an effort by a, a team a few years ago, um, at the time out of UMass, starting to do some, some recordings and working at two different sites um, within the, uh, the Hudson uh, River Estuary National uh, Estuary and Research Reserve. Um, and one of the, in addition to being able to find well-characterized fish sounds, like things like toadfish and some catfish, you know, what they were finding was a whole host of mystery sounds, where you, here you're seeing what's called the waveform of the sound, which is the sort of, or a silicon pressure 
uh, versus time, and then down below it are the spectrograms. And we're, so we're getting all of these really species-specific, unique sounds. The problem is we have no idea who's producing them. So one of the patterns that emerges not only in the Hudson, but in um, aquatic systems around the world, is that everywhere we listen, uh, we're hearing more sounds that we don't know what they are than we do that, that who's producing them. So how do you solve this problem? So one of the things that we do um, in ecology and evolutionary biology is this idea of inference, where where can we take information that we you know know or predict in one particular context and start applying it to another. So what I want to do is take a step back from ecology and go to some fairly hardcore evolution. So this, what you have in front of you, is a depiction of what I could describe as the fish tree of life. So this is what we refer to as a phylogeny or a phylogenetic tree that shows the pattern of relatedness of different species of fish. So where you have different branches are two closely related uh, taxa here, and then every time you see a node represents a common ancestor. And it's a little bit confusing in that you have to sort of read this uh, clockwise. So at the base of the tree, we have the most primitive fishes, the things like sturgeon uh, and bowfin and, and gars, and then going around uh, clockwise, then you'll get some more of the derived fish, um, things like sculpin and eel pouts and groupers and other more fish that you may be common with. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about working on fish is there's about 34,000 living species of fish. There are more species of fish than there are all other vertebrates combined. And one of the rules uh, that or principles that we see that emerge from fish biology is that fish pretty much do everything. And not only do they do everything, um, it tends to evolve repeatedly. And the same is true with sound production. So uh, just to give you an idea, if we slap some obnoxious or some labels on this obnoxious tree to sort of orient you to the, the fish groups that you may be more familiar with, you can see here's our more primitive fish up here. You got stuff in uh, South America in the tropics, the piranhas and the tetras, the catfish or this node right here. You got your salmon, you got the cod and, um, and haddock and things like that, damselfish and cichlids working away. And then, you know, over on this sort of left side of our um, tree are sort of the more fishy uh, like fish that people commonly think of when they go to an aquarium um, or they're scuba diving or fishing or, or something like that. So what I've been doing for the better part of 20 years is that going through as many records as I can find uh, within these 34,000 uh, uh, fish species. And here, these are for simplicity, these, uh, this figure is labeled by f uh, fish family rather than species. The, if you did it species, it'd be even more illegible than it is now. Um, and so going through the scientific literature, uh, looking for every case I can find of fishes producing sounds. Um, and it turns out it's a pretty rich literature with a really long history. The, some of the first descriptions of fish sounds go back to Aristotle. You've got folks like Darwin that were interested in it. Um, and then the field with the advent of digital recording technology has exploded in recent years. Um, it is a really, really active uh, uh, area of study. So if we take our records of fish sound production and we plot them on this tree, it looks something like this, where each of these blue dots represents a family of fish that has been documented to produce sounds. And so rather than being this really sort of quirky field uh, or quirky phenomenon with only one or two random species producing sounds, lo and behold, it, you know, from this analysis, we can start to see that many, if not most, species of fish are producing sound in, in some context. And where you have gaps, like these happen to be a lot of the deep sea fishes, um, a lot of these are, are fish that have never been analyzed before. People have never tried recording them. Um, and so in many cases, what we are overwhelmed with is an absence of evidence rather than an evidence of absence. And so my suspicion is that as this field continues to proliferate, uh, we will be able to fill in more uh, components of this circle with even more blue, uh, blue dots. And so this is sort of what I think about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's jump back to the Hudson. So when I go to different places, one of the first things that I really like to see is a fish checklist. I get really excited about seeing a place with great fish diversity. And so this is the, the Hudson River Estuary Program fish checklist that you can download from the DEC website. I'm sure many, if not most of you, are familiar with it to some degree. What we see are 226 different species uh, found along the stretch of the Hudson. Um, I believe there was a goby that was just uh, reported from the Hudson, so now it's 227. And so this is the way that most folks view it from a biodiversity perspective. But the way that I start to view uh, 
uh, fish checklists and things like this saying, okay, well, how many of these fish produce sound? So if we overlay uh, the number of fish that have been recorded before uh, with a green box, that starts to look like something like this, where it's not just one or two, we have dozens of fish that have been recorded uh, from the Hudson River, which gives us a lot that we can do with this idea of recording sounds. Um, then you could say, well, some of these fish may not have been recorded before, but they're closer related that have been recorded uh, and produce sounds. So what does that look like? So if we take uh, species from members of families that produce sounds and put a little blue box around their name, we get something like this. So what you can see is the vast majority of fishes found in the Hudson River that we know of are likely producing sound in some context. So what immediately emerges is we have a lot to work with, that the idea of using a hydrophone to understand soundscapes uh, and fish diversity actually may, uh, there may be something to that. So how do we go from a list like this saying, well, yeah, these guys at Cornell, uh, they think they know what fish sounds like, but you just showed us a picture of all of these unknown sounds. How do you reconcile uh, what might be producing sounds with the sounds that you get? And so we can use uh, uh, several different methods uh, to try to do this. So we can go, there's a number of online data repositories where you can listen to different sounds. So one example is our uh, sister department within the Lab of Ornithology, the Macaulay Library of Animal Sounds that has a, a whole host of fish sounds as well as uh, sounds from other critters. There's also, uh, you know, other repositories known, um, the discovery of uh, sound in the sea, where uh, from an educational perspective, people can download and listen to example fish sounds. We can go to the scientific literature and look for records of spectrograms or waveforms, or from the older literature, uh, anecdotal accounts or qualitative descriptions uh, of, of different events. Um, and then we can do things like targeted fish recording, saying, okay, you know, enough homework, enough looking at, at you know, computers and, uh, and books, let's go ahead and get out into the field. So with the, the massive reduction in cost of things like hydrophones uh, that you can buy for as little as a hundred bucks or GoPro cameras, you can do things like this, um, where here we have a bluegill, uh, a whole colony of bluegills just kind of hanging out, uh, you know, having some, creating some nests, attracting, trying to attract females, you may hear some thumping in the background. Um, and we can take species that we know there's bluegill uh, up and down the Hudson. There's also happened to be uh, bluegill in, uh, in Ithaca. So during a pandemic, I don't have to travel anywhere. I can go down the road and record uh, a variety of fish species that I can then leverage that information for understanding the Hudson. And then we can do things like uh, taking some of these fish where, where it's amenable uh, and putting them in fish tanks uh, to try to record them. So here are, is an example of a couple of very confused striped bass uh, in Maya's uh, building at the Nori Point Environmental Center, uh, trying to get them to, uh, to perform uh, on camera, as it were. Um, so we can use a combination of these different approaches to start to fill in our understanding of, of which species are producing sounds. So what I want to do now is give an example of, so what does this look like? So, you know, you've, we've described how, you know, how fish make sounds. Um, the uh, you know the diversity of it, but but what does this actually mean in terms of understanding ecology? So what I want to do is show you a case study that that we've been working on for a little while um, that happens to highlight two species of fish that are found uh, on the lower stretch of the, of the Hudson. These data happen to be uh, from off the coast of Georgia or and North Florida, um, but the overall pattern um, is really going to be the same up and down. Uh, the Atlantic coast where these fish uh, are, are broadly distributed. So we have the two uh, characters um, in this story. We have the oyster toadfish that you saw earlier. Um, so both of these fish produce sounds in courtship displays where males are advertising to females. Uh, toadfish sit on the bottom and occupy uh, little nests as they're, as they're calling and they kind of sound like this. And this is sort of honking sound that sort of uh, is, is a pretty common uh, component of, of underwater soundscapes um, throughout most of the spring and summer. And then on the right, we have black drum. Um, and you can see that lo in looking at these spectrograms, the, both species produce fairly uh, different uh, species specific sounds um, with, uh, with harmonic information. Um, they're about half a second long uh, in duration. And so black drum produce uh, a couple of different types of calls, but they more, do it more in a couple of different contexts. So here you have, at the beginning of the mating season, 
the drum are starting to ramp up their calling. Uh, I'm going to play this, but it's low frequency, so depending on people's uh, home uh, speaker setup may be uh, difficult to hear, but it kind of sounds uh, like this. Listen for a low booming sound. And if you're not hearing it, you can take my word for it. But if you look at the uh, at the spectrogram, you're seeing you know a sound here and a sound here. And again, we're getting that ranging information where here's some more distant fish, here's some that are closer to the recording device. So this is when the the the, the breeding season is starting. But when these guys really get going, uh, the spectrogram looks something like this, where it's just a giant smear of sounds right on top of each other. It's an absolute cacophony. We're just the sort of booming um and this you know may sort of be analogous to what uh people are hearing um uh, during the cicada emergence what's interesting about both of these species of fish is they're also really loud so underwater uh black drum uh produces a sound that's about 165 decibels so when converted to in air it's about the same loudness as uh standing about three feet away from a jackhammer that's going um and so you can imagine what all of these fish producing really loud sounds uh, must do to the soundscape. So here's 30 seconds uh, of, of sound. Uh, you could listen to it from each of these species. You can see those individual sounds sort of in these little uh, inlet insets uh, in the upper right. And you could listen to this and you can see a couple of different patterns. We see uh, differences in frequency. Here's the, the, the fun, what we call the fundamental frequency or the lowest frequency component of black drum and the harmonics at 200 and almost 300 hertz. And then the toadfish um, are sort of shifted a, uh, a little bit higher, but it's these constant uh, lines going from left to right. So this 30 seconds of sound, you could listen to this very easily, easily pick up the fish. If we zoom out in time, we're, when we're recording, we're recording for, for way longer than 30 seconds. So here's what 24 hours looks like. Uh, in the life of these fish, where you can see that black drum start their calling at about just after sunset, uh, and they go through the night and then stop right at about sunrise. You know, things like passing ships are really just these sort of incidental sounds. But what we're getting with the black drum are these, you know, eight to 12 hour long choruses uh, throughout the night where they are just dominating the soundscape uh, during the, the mating season. And meanwhile, toadfish, when they're calling, you just kind of call all day long. These two horizontal lines are the continuous sound of a toadfish chorus, really just calling uh, nonstop throughout the day. So here's 24 hours of sound. Here's six months of sound where we can begin to see this overall soundscape. So things like passing ships are just now these single lines. Maybe you're getting some storms in there, but they're a fairly insignificant acoustic event compared to the, the footprint, as it were, of the black drum chorus here um, and then the toadfish chorus here. Um, and you can see that we're getting, you know, a month of, of, of sound in this case for, from the black drum uh, and nearly two months of chorusing activity uh, from the toadfish. So if this is about five and a half to six months, here's what six years begin to look like, where here we have um, this at the same site year after year, hydrophone just listening, I've taken the sound, put it through the computer, visualized it by taking, uh, creating a spectrogram, and every year you can see uh, the onset and duration of black drum and toadfish. Some years uh, black drum start earlier, sometimes they call longer, and then it immediately raises the question, well, uh, why is that? And so um, what we do is then we go to uh, data repositories um, and start uh, finding satellite-derived sea surface temperature and saying, okay, well, maybe it's a function of, uh, of water temperature. So off this particular coast of Florida, what we can see throughout the year, starting in November, going to June, year after year, at the same point in the year, we may see as much as a 10 or 15 degree temperature difference between the coldest part of the year um, at, um, or for the, the coldest year on record versus sort of a more warm uh, season. And we, you know, it generally gets, you know, colder, obviously in the fall, the coldest around January, and then warms up throughout the spring. What I can do is, you know, through things like uh, data visualization and data science, say, okay, let's take our colds and our warms and put them on a color ramp. We'll make the, the, the cold temperatures blue and the warm temperatures red uh, and look at it from left to right uh, across our spectrogram. Uh, and it looks something like this, where you're seeing uh, sort of the, the cool season in the middle uh, and then the warm season 
on the tail ends of this spectrogram. And then if we overlay the sounds of the fish, here's what it looks like where we're seeing, you know, once it starts to warm up or when the black drums start calling. And once it gets even warmer, um, the toadfish st start calling. And then, you know, again, we add back our labels of the onset and duration of the calls. And you can see that where you have early black drum calling at this particular site, it happens to be warm years. Um, and then where the black drum are calling later and for a short amount of time happen to be cool years. The overall pattern is the same. First, it's black drum, then it's the toadfish. Um, but there's quite a bit of uh, plasticity um, in when they start calling and how long they go for. And we can do some statistics uh, on this and see that clearly the occurrence of coursing behavior uh, is um, significantly related to things like water temperature. But it's not just the onset of behavior. Um, one of the things that's interesting too is that these fish use uh, dedicated muscles in their body uh, to produce sounds. And uh, because fish are cold blooded, the muscles are contracting faster as the water temperatures get warmer. And so what we see is the frequency components of the sound also increase with warming water temperatures. So not only do, does water temperature influence the occurrence of the behavior, it's directly modifying the signal properties of the, of the call that the fishes produce. So this is sort of an overall high level case study of how you can use information about uh, fish um, and start to get a bigger picture of the dynamics of their calling behavior and what it means for the ecosystem in which they live. So let's go from this particular case study and jump back to the Hudson. Um, and so uh, last year, despite the pandemic, we actually were ended up being pretty successful uh, being able to deploy instruments on different stretches of the Hudson. And this is really due um, to the, the, not only the location, but just the, the, the fortuitous collaboration with both uh, Patrick and Maya, that having collaborators on site when we in Ithaca are locked down, we can't travel. Um, it's really wonderful having collaborators who can easily get instrumentation in uh, and start to collect data. And so we worked uh, last year, we recorded about five different sites, um, each for about five or six months, um, you know, down as, you know, as far south as, as Furnace Brook, um, above and below the Maiden Lane Dam. Um, and then up around the Nori Point Environmental Center, uh, Enderkill Creek and Black Creek, and you can see blowouts of those here. Um, and each of these were sort of designed to sort of start to target different questions. Um, and then we've got a number of other recorders that were moving up and down uh, the Hudson to record other events uh, as they uh, are either are interesting or we have questions or there's sort of management or regulatory contexts um, uh, that emerge. And so comparing both above and below the water uh, of the Hudson. So this is at Nori Point, and this is about a week of sound. Uh, and so on the left two panels, you can see hydrophones. On the right, you can see microphones at the same site. And so below water, you can see this uh, the acoustic footprint of a storm coming through. Here's some different fish activity. Uh, above the water, you're seeing uh, spring peepers you're, uh, at, in the evenings. That Here's that same storm event. Um, and then during the day, you're getting a combination of birds and insects calling. So even at the same site, above and below water, we have completely different uh, uh, animal constituents calling that are detectable, uh, but these abiotic or environmental events like storms are readily detectable. And then if we look at a sort of a shifted frequency scale, so here on the top two panels, we have a linear frequency scale going from zero to 4,000 Hertz. Down below, uh, this is what we refer to as a one third octave band a representation where we can get better clarity on some of the low frequency components. And here, those fish sounds are more readily identifiable. Um, the top part of the storm is, is scrunched down, but you can see that low frequency component. And then for the, for the microphone here, you can clearly see the birds and insects, the storm, and then the frogs are just these little pixels uh, up at the top of the screen. So this gives you an idea of what Nori Point might look or sound like uh, for a week during uh, spring of 2020. Um, and then jumping down, uh, to Furnace Brook, you know, we're getting all sorts of sounds. So here's some, some focal recordings of patterned uh, sounds, certainly from fish, not really sure which ones yet, um, but you can start to see a bunch of different types of sounds that are emer uh, emerging um, with different patterns of uh, sort of pulses or, or snaps or pops um, that emerge. And within the idea of looking at barrier removal within the Hudson, there's certainly a lot of stakeholder interest on both sides of it uh, from this. And one of the things that 
in using acoustics that we can do is start to look at, okay, well, what does barrier removal do to be able to these communities? Can, uh, so we're able to go in to the Maiden Lane Dam, record above and below the dam before the, it was removed, and get an idea of the soundscape. And then we can go back this year and then uh, figure out uh, how do things sound. And so, you know, here's about a week or so of sound um, above the dam. And then in that low, that sort of uh, shifted frequency scale, you can see an increase in water flow starting in early March. Um, so this is above the dam. Uh, here's below uh, that same dam where it's really dominated by flow noise, um, not nearly as quiet as it is above the dam. In addition to things like barriers, you know, clearly the Hudson is, is a pretty active stretch uh, with, with humans uh, moving up and down the sides of it. So um, here's an example of what ships look like on, on the Hudson. So this is recorded uh, a little over a month ago, um, this happened to be uh, some survey work with some uh, for the sturgeon tagging um, that was going on that we'll talk a little bit uh, more about later. But you can see that with these, you know, clearly uh, visible ship crossings, uh, you can see it, uh, the sh ship as it gets closer to the hydrophone, this is the closest point of intersection and then it starts getting farther away. Um, and it's really dominating much of the bandwidth. So this is going from about zero uh, to 12,000 Hertz. Um, and it's a, you can imagine that with this noise footprint of ships, it could really be difficult for other, um, other critters to be able to hear each other uh, amidst this backdrop. This is something that we refer to as, uh, as masking and as one of the potential consequences of, uh, of human-induced noise uh, in aquatic systems. Uh, it's not just uh, aquatic transit that's an issue. Um, here's a slide that, uh, and some data that Patrick Baker had collected, uh, something that he affectionately refers to as uh, four frogs in a train where in this spectrogram, that's about uh, 35 seconds in duration, you can clearly see four different species of frogs, you know, these spring peepers just going constantly. Um, but then here's a, the signature from trains um, that's pretty much dominating this low frequency register. And one of the questions that emerges when we look at noise um, is, is what are the, what, you know, what are the consequences? Do animals care? Does it, is it just masking? Can they just not hear each other? Or are there other elements of stress or disrupted behavior um, that emerge uh, from something uh, like this? So last year was, a, as you can imagine, a tough year to try to start a new project. Um, we're just underway sort of in our second field season this year. There's a number of sort of uh, things that where we're going in some of our future direction. We've got uh, a, a lab facility uh, here in Ithaca where we've been able to collect fish that are found um, locally, but also are the same species they found on Hudson. So we've got a, an aquarium room full of fish with hydrophones constantly going to try to get lab based or lab recorded sounds that we can then look back at um, and from field recordings and start to match the species. Uh, with those calling animals from field settings. Um, what we want to start to do is figure out what is this sort of seasonal pattern and rhythm of the Hudson River? When do species start calling? How long are they going for? When do they stop? How are the different species groups that call together? How are they uh, dividing up frequency space? Or how are they minimizing their overlap? How can we get into some of these you know, sort of human-driven contexts of things like barrier removal, um, you know, what does, what does the removal of dams uh, create for, for Hudson soundscapes, um, you know, and being able to compare places like Furnaceburg to other sites uh, in the Hudson that are, are similar, similar tributaries that may or may not be sort of having uh, barrier removal evaluated as, a, uh, as an intervention there. Where we're currently at, a number of really exciting things going on. Um, so one of the things that being fish ecologists with, and listening to fish, you know, we can also talk to other fish uh, fisheries biologists. So, you know, Maya is so perfectly positioned and is able to work really nicely with the, uh, the DEC fisheries team, you know, and so I'm stuck in Ithaca. Uh, Maya has the good fortune of getting, uh, hopping on the phone saying, okay, let's get ready to go out on a boat. And this is a picture she sent me yesterday where she's targeting, uh, the Atlantic sturgeon, uh, aggregation that's, that's happening. And so, you know, with these complementary, you know, complementary species surveys, DEC is tagging fish, they're doing underwater video tows, they're doing um, different sorts of, of censuses uh, for them. And this is a case where we can piggyback a lot of our acoustics on these known observations 
uh, of, of sturgeon. So not only can we go after Atlantic sturgeon, uh, we can go after short nose sturgeon with a similar effort. And, you know, and so here's a bunch of sturgeon that are uh, about ready to be tagged that are in a pen. We can drop a hydrophone into there, hear what they're sounding like, but then also put a bottom mounted recorder um, around the aggregation site to see uh, what's, um, what sounds these aggregations may be making, and could we in fact figure out when spawning is starting of uh, sturgeon. So even though sound production is well known in sturgeons, it's, it's kind of surprising that these two species critical to the Hudson have never been recorded before. So uh, I'm hoping that, you know, in the future, I can come back to you sort of being able to play back uh, sturgeon sounds. These, these, you know, the recorders for the Atlantic sturgeon just went in the water, the short nose sturgeon recorders just came out, um, and so these are sort of data that, are, that will be uh, uh, coming in, in the very near future. We can also look at the migration of, the, of herring uh, up and down the river. So we put hydrophones near uh, some of the, the weirs uh, on Black Creek and being able to get the, the herring moving uh, through those um, uh, different, different systems. Um, so this has been a really exciting project. It's really a fun, uh, fun thing to be a part of. Um, I wanna be able to, uh, to thank uh, our funding from the uh, New York State Water Resources Institute here at, at Cornell. Um, we've had a number of students and staff uh, and collaborators uh, involved in the project. Um, and then, you know, if you want to learn more about uh, about bioacoustics, you know, follow us on uh, on the web uh, or on Twitter. And if you have any questions, uh, happy to take those now. Um, or if uh, you want to email me uh, in the future, always happy to uh, to, to to talk more about it. So. Uh, so thank you. Great, Aaron, thank you so much for that talk. Um, so a reminder to everyone, if you have questions for Aaron, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. And we've got one already, um, which I'll, I'll read out loud. So I know that the constant noise of commercial lawn equipment in my neighborhood stresses me out. Do loud continued noises affect, affect fish? So that, Doreen, that's a great question. And I think it's a really wonderful context to think about the influence of noise. So, you know, not only can you hear it and it's obnoxious, um, the, but, you know, you get, and it's, it's difficult to hear people talk, but you can also, you know, you feel sort of a pressure in your chest, your breathing may get more shallow. And so you not only have sort of auditory components of, of the noise, but there's also sort of like central physiological changes, you know, in a stress response that, that you may be having as well. And so, you know, other vertebrates are doing the same thing. So maybe lawn equipment, it'd be really interesting to look at, you know, for, for waterfront property, can fish in fact pick up uh, things like lawn mowers, but most certainly we see similar physiological and behavioral responses to noise. One of the things that's really interesting that's emerged in the last couple of years is that, you know, not only do, do does uh, noise influence communication, but we find that fish in noisy situations are more vulnerable to predators, their feeding rates change. And so we have not only acoustic impacts to fish, but a bunch of other non-acoustic impacts uh, from anthropogenic noise. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, ocean noise pollution or aquatic noise pollution um, is really gain finally gaining the attention that it deserves sort of within the scientific uh, and regulatory community. Thanks for that question, that's great. Thank you. Is there potential to use bioacoustic monitoring to track the movement of invasive species, such as the round goby, into the Hudson? Absolutely. So this is something that we've been trying to do. Um, round goby sounds were first described in the Russian literature in the 60s, um, and uh, there have been a bunch of different efforts uh, around Lake Erie uh, and just north of there to record round goby sounds. And so one of the things that we've thought about is could you set up almost like an acoustic uh, trap line, as it were, um, you know, as gobies are migrating or moving, could you in fact pick up uh, those sounds as they're going? We're doing something similar with uh, with lionfish in the Caribbean, where you have these uh, invasive species that first start out relatively rare. Acoustics is so great in aquatic environments because the range over which we can hear is much greater than the, the visual area over which we can see. And so sort of this, this acoustic sensing provides a really great way to pick up what would might otherwise be, uh, be cryptic species. Great, thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your work in the New York bite with humpback whales? Yes, absolutely. So we did, uh, one of the things that's been a lot of fun is when we started doing work in New York Bite, we did a, an acoustic survey in 2008, 2009, really when DEC said, we got a bunch of whales here, but we're not sure when they're here. Could you tell us something about that? And this was when I was first coming to Cornell. 
uh, we did some seasonal surveys and lo and behold, there were whales throughout the bite. Uh, and then we did this, just finished this recent uh, study um, where we get humpback whales, right whales, fin whales in New York bite year round. We've been working with uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society um, on sort of recording humpbacks sort of in the lower harbor estuary and trying to document how often they're going in. We just had a paper come out in collaboration with WCS uh, describing, um, you know, that's one of the first to describe seasonal occurrence of humpbacks in the bite. But one of the things that is interesting is that they're, they're absolutely there throughout much of the year. Really, one of the questions is, is there uh, occurrence increasing? Is, has there been a shift in their ecosystem that's causing them to uh, call New York home more often? Um, is, it, is it availability of food? Uh, who knows what it is? Um, and so sort of now we've got these, you know, from these large data sets, um, we've got sort of a baseline where we can go forward, where we can under, start to understand changes uh, in the occurrence of large whales like humpbacks in a way that we just simply had no data before. So it was really difficult to a answer the question, are they increasing or decreasing? How often are they there? Great, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is from me. Uh, so we had a, an event a couple of weeks ago that was water science through storytelling and it was a panel discussion. And one of our panelists was John Bowermaster who's made films about aquatic ecology of the Hudson River. And he mentioned that um, some of his students have used soundscapes as a storytelling device, as an artistic way to convey this information. And I'm wondering if you've had any experience in your work working with artists or creating soundscapes, you know, for people as a storytelling device to share information about fisheries and acoustics. Absolutely. That's a great question. So, you know, not surprisingly, many people in, in bioacoustics uh, come from a music background. I happen to be a terrible cellist. Uh, but it's something that I enjoy. They're far better musicians in, in, in the field than I am. Um, but there's this regular intersection between the uh, musicians and, uh, and bioacoustics. There's a wonderful paper uh, about a decade ago from a mentor of mine uh, called The Music of Nature and the Nature of Music, talking about the commonalities of sound, whether it's music, whether it's animals singing. Uh, and I had the good fortune of speaking in DC a few years ago. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences ho hosts a panel called the DC Art and Science e Evening Rendezvous. And it's a, a regularly running panel available on YouTube that you can watch where it brings together scientists and artists uh, to talk about the commonalities of their work. This particular uh, theme that I was speaking on, I was talking about ocean noise, uh, but there happened to be the principal cellist from the National Symphony Orchestra. He's playing a humpback song on his cello. Uh, there's somebody doing uh, a, uh, something known as data sonification. We're just listening to quantitative data acoustically. Um, you know, and so there's all of these different intersection points. And so it's really, I always really enjoy talking to musicians because they hear things uh, in our recordings that I otherwise wouldn't pay attention to. One of our um, bat acoustics person, where I work, uh, came from a violin background. Mm -hmm. that, that corroborates what you're just saying. I'd, I had a question about geomorphology. Uh, you talked about, um, it, well, can you talk about what you hear in terms of sediment transport across the bottom of a stream? And uh, can, can you pick up patterns of when the sediment is moving versus when it's not? Yes, uh, and, and a couple of different ways. So we can definitely hear you know, it's going to show up sort of a lower frequency register. There's also another type of sensor that you can use. Uh, it functions similarly to a hydrophone, but it's called a geophone. And this is uh, commonly used in, in geology and geophysics in, in the marine and aquatic environment, where it's really got really, really good low frequency sensitivity. Um, and so, the, you know, being able to have for some of these multi-channel recording devices, you could put in your hydrophone to hear the critters and you could plug in a geophone and you would be able to hear things like sediment transport. So, you know, certainly with a hydrophone, you know, having, you know, most of the, most of the sediment transport sounds are going to be sort of in a lower frequency domain, really at the bottom of, of sort of our audible uh, um, frequency range. Um, we may hear things like, like water flow. And so we can look at, at uh, high and low periods of flow. But then with things like geophones, we could definitely look at how is the sediment moving. And if you had a large scale sensor network and sort of think of a grid uh, going over a certain area, you could be able to start mapping the sound field and use that as a way uh, to infer uh, how, um, how sediments may, uh, may, be, may be moving. Yeah, I think within the geology world, there's increasing uh, awareness that mass transport tends to happen in, in episodic pulses. There's a landslide, there's a storm, there's a something. Um, 
as opposed to what we might have learned in elementary school, which is little by little, raindrop by raindrop, the mountains wear down. It's really not so much that, it's that there are these events where mm -hmm. mass wasting of movement, um, and, and those happen with predictable, free, you know, some sort of frequency. And so, yes, the mountains get formed and the rivers do their thing. But I was wondering if the, I'm wondering if this could corroborate any of those thought processes. Well, and, and I think there's a, a number of different interesting uh, applications. So we hear things like earthquakes, you know, so much of, of bioacoustics as a field sort of emerged from other fields. So, you know, being able to use ocean sensors to pick up whales, well, a lot of that uh, comes out of trying to pick up uh, undersea earthquakes or much of bioacoustics in its present formation uh, directly comes from World War II with anti-submarine warfare. And so the first hydrophones were developed by the US Navy. Sure. They became available to civilians shortly after uh, World War II. Um, and so this field is directly a result of listening to the aquatic environment in very, other, uh, very different um, uh, applications. Yeah, we use VLF geophysics to, to uh, identify water bearing fractures. Sure. Yeah. I mean, or you could buy a hydrophone and listen for cracks in your swimming pool. I mean, you know, this like, yeah. and again, there's all these non, you know, it's, it's the same technology. It's the same sort of analysis and visualization process. Really what's changing is who's producing the sound. Yes. We've got another question mm -hmm. on this art and science intersection, mm -hmm. which is, you know, something that I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, is there a possibility that your recordings could be made available for musicians who are interested in jamming with the fishes for educational recordings? Absolutely. Um, so there's an, uh, I'm happy to provide recordings. Uh, I have my email address both on the front slide and the end, but it's arice at cornell.edu. Happy to share stuff. There's also a, a wide variety of um, publicly and freely available uh, sounds in nature in different contexts available on the web, so places like Dosits, places like Macaulay Library, um, and that can be a really a really great way to do it. But I'm certainly happy to, to share stuff, both from, from Hudson, New York Byte, or anywhere around the world. Great. I'm, I'm sure you'll get some follow-up on that. I think there's ripe with collaboration opportunities here. Mm -hmm. Aaron, how serious is, and this is just an opinion question, how serious is underwater noise pollution as an issue? Um, likely serious, but one of the challenges is that we don't know how serious it is. There's a number of uh, possible impacts ranging from stress and behavior to things like suppressed uh, reproduction in some species. The challenge is that not only trying to understand the rate at which anthropogenic noise is increasing, the spatial extent that it's current, occurring in, but trying to reconcile that within sort of the lifespan of some of these critters. So things like bowhead whales uh, living in sort of in the Arctic Ocean live 200 to 300 years. You know, what's happened uh, with anthropogenic noise since, you know, in the last 50 years, um, we may not be able to detect changes in whale uh, ecology fast enough to understand its level of impact. So this is one of the reasons why fish are a great experimental system um, is that we know that, you know, they have a shorter lifespan, they're more, you can more easily do experiments or observations with them than you can whales. And so we're really trying to get a handle on what are the consequences of noise? Does it matter? My, my opinion is probably yes, but how is it manifesting itself? Um, and it, as you can imagine, it becomes a really contentious conversation uh, within different stakeholder groups. So you have, let's say the shipping industry or the offshore wind industry trying to, you know, go about their business they're being held to a certain regulatory standard uh, on noise reduction and noise mitigation. And then you have other groups that are saying, oh, you're gonna kill all the whales, you're gonna kill all the fish. What's plaguing all of this conversation is that we just don't have the data yet. And so this is a really, really quickly proliferating field. I think there's more work being done uh, in the marine environment than there is in the aquatic environment. But I think that's really driven by primarily awareness rather than need or urgency. Emily, I think we're out of time, am I right? Yeah, we've come to the end of the hour and actually got through everyone's questions. So thank you so much, Aaron, for your fascinating talk. I have so much to think about now. Um, looking forward to hearing some fish musician collaborations in the future. If somebody does that, please let us know. And thank you to everyone for joining us for our last breakfast lecture of the 2020-21 season. We hope you have a great summer and we'll be back with more lectures in a, a potentially at the diner in a to be determined format uh, in September. So we look forward to seeing you um, online or in person when we're able. Fantastic.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great summer. Aaron, thank you very much. My pleasure.